Well, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for coming along. Uh, this is uh, a, a webinar on um, nuclear weapons and nuclear business and climate change. And we have two really good speakers tonight. I'm Dave Webb, by the way. I'm a member of the Green Party Peace, Security and Defence Policy Working Group and also a member of CND. And this webinar is being hosted by Yorkshire CND. So we have two excellent speakers. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from Phil Weber, who's Chair of Scientists for Global Responsibility. He spent 12 years as a research physicist at Imperial College and has a PhD in surface science and was active in Science Against Nuclear Arms, or SANA, as it was, co-authoring London After the Bomb and leaving after leaving academia, Phil headed one of the UK's leading and award-winning environmental programmes in Kirklees Council uh, up to 2011. After this, he spent a short period as a visiting professor at the University of Leeds working on city-scale low-carbon programmes. So he's qualified in nuclear weapons, no, not in nuclear weapons, but talking about nuclear weapons, trying to get rid of them, and also in the climate. So it's excellent to you can come along, Phil. So would you like to start and then we'll... Okay, thanks very much for the introduction. I'll just share screen. Okay, so we've got that up. So just to say um, some a few words about Sciences for Global Responsibility, which has followed on from organisations such as SANA, which was one of its uh, founders. Um, and we're very we are a membership organization so we're always welcome members and we always welcome donations and they can be made for our charitable trusts so i should say that um we're very much about um challenging the misuse of science and technology which we as we say in our latest recruitment leaflet the misuse of science and technology is fueling climate and ecological breakdown war and global injustice so that's the summary. Um, right, I shall kick off with my presentation. And I'm assuming this will be available later on, and I can provide references to everything I'm saying. I've put some at the end, but probably not all. So, to start off with, um, the position we're in is that uh, 2023 has been judged the most dangerous in humanity's history. That's by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and they've set their atomic clock at 90 seconds to midnight, which is the closest to disaster they've ever put it. Um, and there's, several, there's a few reasons for that. I'm not going to go into all of them, but so why are the, what are the reasons? So... They say there's a new heightened risk of nuclear war, a growing climate emergency, and they say that we're breaching six of nine planetary survival boundaries. I'll say a bit more about what those are. And they also, interestingly, and worryingly, I suppose, say we've got political systems riven with dangerous and deliberate misinformation, which I think is a key, a key factor. So I mentioned the planetary boundaries, and I do give a reference. This is a very recent update. A few years ago, there would have been fewer breaches, but each one of these sectors shows an area which we depend on as humanity for our survival. And if we're in the green, we're in a safe operating space, and if we're outside it, particularly well outside it, that's risking the future of humanity, basically. And there's quite a few areas where we're doing that. I mean, the one, one of the ones we're talking about today is the levels of uh, climate changing emissions. You'll see there's a very big one on the genetic side. There's another very big one on novel entities, which means new chemicals which we're putting into the environment. We've no idea what they might do. You can see there's a couple of good ones that we haven't wrecked the ozone layer and we haven't loaded the atmosphere with too much aerosols because we've controlled those. And as yet, we haven't over acidified the oceans. 
there's some big phosphate and nitrate flows into water supplies, which is a major problem. Anything in the red could eventually, we don't know, because nobody really knows, threatens the future survival of people on this planet and quite a lot of the organisms that share the planet with us and which we depend on. So this doesn't include nuclear weapons because clearly we haven't had a nuclear war. But in my next slide, I've just put on this what you would see or what the impact of a nuclear war would be. It, it would be huge. And I think it's worth considering that. And when people talk about planetary boundaries and if we are going to combine climate um, ecological and um, nuclear problems, I think we need to find another way of not forgetting to mention nuclear weapons. So I've just put that on to give an idea that nuclear, if there was a nuclear war of any level, it would really destabilize the whole planet in ways we really don't know. We know about some of them, but a lot we don't. So I think it's a huge risk quite quite apart from enormous numbers of people killed and horrendous impacts on vital ecosystems i'll just mention one the loss of the ozone layer would mean that phytoplankton would be in severe would have a severe problem and they're the main organism that uh, creates the air we breathe basically so um moving on to the military side of things just looking at the latest figures, this global military spending is huge. It it keeps reaching record highs. It's $2,240 billion equivalent. Um, here are the main spenders. The USA is a huge spender with 40% of world military spending then followed by China and Russia. You'll note that the USA spends 10 times more than Russia, but India and Saudi Arabia aren't far behind, as is the UK, Germany and France. So the USA is a major military spender. And you have to beg the question when people say, oh, Ru uh, Russia's a terrible threat, when you've got a 10 to 1 spending ratio like that have to ask a few questions but it's it's huge sums of money um going on to the climate the in cop 15 back in 2009 the developing countries or developed so-called developed countries agreed to find 100 billion a year for climate action to help the developing countries not um, create loads of emissions or keep them at low levels but they didn't even find that. They found about 80 billion a year and about half of that was in loans. The net result of that, and I've heard quite a lot of very angry people talk about this who were involved in these negotiations over the years, has been that the COP process has been undermined. There's been a massive erosion of trust. And the latest figures that people talk about, if you're going to be realistic, would be something like a thousand billion a year globally, not this rather political target of a hundred billion, which haven't even met that. But I'd point out here that effective climate action will cost less than half of global military spending. So I think that's worth. So you could argue that military spending is already starving um, the, the resources. It's certainly diverting significant numbers of resources. Now, looking at the UK, in recent years, UK military spending has gone up dramatically from just under 46 billion, 21, 22, to what is planned to be about 52 billion, 24, 25. That excludes, it's even bigger than that because there's 2.3 billion a year allocated to Ukraine, and there's been another half billion announced recently for more um, ammunition, essentially. The other thing, part of this spending, is new nuclear weapon spending, 
which means the new nuclear-armed, nuclear-powered submarines, that's Dreadnought, to replace Trident, more nuclear weapons, 260, up from 180, and the whole fleet of conventionally armed, but nuclear-powered submarines, Trafalgar and Astute, and the uh, UK-Australian-US deal to make uh, build submarines. I should say, though, that the, the UK's own audit body have said that Dreadnought and these modular nuclear power systems which power them are undeliverable because basically they don't know how to build them. Um, and I noticed recently, and Andy may mention this, is that the latest modular reactor project's just been cancelled because the costs escalated so dramatically. Um, the other point I make here, and it parallels the global situation, is that military spending is seven to eight times bigger spending on the environment. And I'd also like to draw your attention to recent figures, um, which I researched to settle teachers' pay or doctors' pay, nurses, and so on. When the government says, oh, we haven't got the money, well, they found it for nuclear weapons, but they've chosen not to find money to settle teachers pay or doctors and nurses and i would argue that they deserve that those pay rises they've clearly vital for our basic human needs and it i it sort of highlights the choices that are made there's also an effective subsidy for the rosebank oil and gas field of around 3.7 billion that's spread over several years the other point here, which links the military and um, the, the climate, are that military carbon emissions are absolutely huge and the MOD have no meaningful reduction targets. They can actually meet their very weak targets by doing nothing because they only count the emissions from the estate. They don't count emissions from actually doing anything operationally, flying around or firing weaponry. Uh, it's only their building. So it's a very limited um, assessment of their impact, uh, very inadequate. Um, and here's, um, in this slide, you can see that if the global military was um, a country, it would be the fourth largest emitter globally behind China, United States and India. And what that means is that the military emissions are a significant obstacle to reducing emissions because we really need to get these down to zero. And the military is already a huge emitter globally. Turning to nuclear deterrence, just to say a few words about some of the rhetoric. Um, we're all we're told, particularly in the UK, that nuclear weapons keep us safe. They work every day. We have a nuclear umbrella. I think the first thing I'd say is that's a, an extremely arrogant um, statement. Most of the world doesn't want and hasn't got nuclear weapons. There are also extensive uncompensated impacts from testing and uranium mining. And they're very they're often in indigenous populations across the world. There's been serious nuclear misses over the last 70 years, equipment failure, false alarms, these are most dangerous during military exercises. There was a very bad one at the Cuba Missile Crisis. There was a very bad one in 1983 during the NATO Able Archer, for example. So you'd have to say we've been lucky so far because the only thing that stopped a nuclear war that we know of has been individuals who didn't obey their orders effectively. Um, the ones we know of, interestingly enough, were both Soviet. One of them was a Soviet um, submarine weapons officer. Another one was a colonel who was supposed to fire nuclear weapons and refused to do so. So nuclear weapons aren't an umbrella. They wouldn't even stop the rain. They're an unstoppable mega death threat. That's what they're intended to be. The Ukraine war and the Gaza bombardment are taking place under this threat or supposed umbrella as well. I think we should, and there's been a whole range of um, 
military, disastrous military invasions. Um, turning to when, if nuclear weapons were used, they're designed to be very destructive. We've worked out using extremely cautious, conservative estimates that one Trident warhead, which is not the biggest by any means of warheads around the place, would kill over 80,000 and injure 200,000, some fatally with burns, fires and fallout. One weapon creates the destruction equivalent to months of artillery shelling in a few seconds. The Red Cross and other organisations stated very clearly that they could not cope with one nuclear weapon. Humanitarian assistance would be impossible. And we've looked at this recently and we've seen that the one nuclear weapon could create casualties, deaths and injuries in equivalent to six months of the Ukraine war in minutes. And... If you look at the Gaza casualty rate, which is similar, I'm afraid there's a parallel, there's a rather chilling parallel there. And as far as we know, the actual level of conventional bombs that's been dropped on Gaza is more than a small nuclear weapon already. It's about twice the explosive power of the Hiroshima weapon, apparently. Um, but of course, it didn't create fireballs and it it didn't create radiation, but it's still causing an enormous casualty rate. But it's prolonged and extended. That's the difference. Whereas a nuclear weapon can do this in minutes or even seconds. Turning to regional nuclear war with 100 Hiroshima, that's a very small size weapon, in say over Kashmir uh, between India and Pakistan, we're talking about a 10 year global nuclear winter with 2 billion at risk of starvation. And then a global nuclear war, that's, I say, only 2,000 to 4,000 warheads, mainly Russian and American, ready to fire in minutes. You're talking to hundreds of millions to over a billion killed and injured, radioactive fallout over huge areas, especially from nuclear reactors, which were very long lived. A very bad nuclear winter, decade or more, ozone destruction and destruction of what's left of our natural environment and civilization at risk. I've put it in inverted commas because I think any all any population that would do this to itself is not worthy of being called civilized. So the mechanism is very simple. Um, nuclear weapons create huge fires. Modern towns, cities are very flammable. And they, because of the intense heat of the fireballs, they inject that smoke and carbon high into the atmosphere above the weather where it stays for a long time. And the latest models have checked that out very carefully. When we first knew about nuclear, or thought about nuclear winter in about 83, we thought it might last a, a year or two. It's now clear from the up-to-date climate models that it would last a decade or more. Just looking at UK nuclear weapons, um, and a UK submarine carries about 40 Trident warheads. It could create a large number of fatalities, deaths across 10 or more cities because the, mis the uh, war uh, missiles are independently targetable. Only 25 warheads are quite capable of leading to catastrophic climate cooling. And it, I find it hard to get my this clear in my head, but the explosive power of nuclear weapons are enormous. I mean, in, in one Trident submarine, there's more firepower than six years of bombing during World War II. That's not in any dispute. There are even single missiles with multiple warheads that have um, huge weapons that have that capability in one or two missiles, which is uh, quite shocking. And if we look at the scenarios here, so the cooling is on the left here, and you, it goes down to minus nine degrees of cooling, and the time scale is in years, and these are the latest studies. So the regional conflicts, the line at the top, 
launch on warning conflicts the line in the middle and the major nuclear conflict is the line at the bottom and not only is there cooling there's severe drought because you've got a massive reduction in rainfall in blue along with a massive cooling which means you it means that things don't grow and you have frosts and you don't have summers it's a very serious ecological problem basically and one trident salvo comes in somewhere between the regional and launch on warning scenario so just i say just one trident submarine there are several american trident submarines that needless to say have more missiles and bigger warheads so they would probably be nearer the launch on warning line and Finally, the, the the explosive power of the launch on warning missiles, I added them up recently, I hadn't done this before, is 260 times that of World War II. It's an enormous uh, firepower. It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. So just a few points to, to say. Um, we've increased, the UK has increased its number of nuclear warheads. I think it's breaching the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty. We've increased military spending well and over above an arbitrary 2% GDP target. Climate spending is grossly inadequate. We've got only two of our four Vanguard submarines working, which has led to very long undersea nuclear patrols, which has to be a major risk because of it's dangerous enough having a nuclear submarine with nuclear missiles in it. And then you've got very tired people having a very long patrol. We've also got preparations for the return of US nuclear weapons to Lake and Heath next year. That's been revealed by data uh, from, I think that was to Congress, um, because they're quite happy to talk about nuclear weapons in the UK, whereas our MOD won't say anything about them. We've also We've already got drop bombs in Europe from the NATO side, and um, it appears that Russia has or may is deploying them to Belarus as well, following on from the Ukraine conflict. That doesn't help anybody, I should say. Most of the world doesn't want nuclear weapons, and, and two countries even decide they'd get rid of them. There are huge areas which are nuclear free, and most countries and over half of them have signed the UN treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons see them as a threat to everyone and that's the treaty of the prohibition of nuclear weapons and there's an upcoming discussion about that in New York pretty soon and then the final point why on earth is this going on and I've what I'm basically suggesting is that there's a parallel between what goes on with fossil fuel problems and the weaponry. What, so why are there so many nuclear weapons? Why is there so much military beyond anything that makes sense? Well, so when it's a cycle of corruption, essentially, so there's huge sums of money. Let's say there's some, whatever the sum of money is for spending on, say, nuclear weapons, then the, the companies get 16 million out of that. These are ICANN figures. That means lobbyists get loads of money then think tanks get a load of money and their job is to basically misinform they're the fake news squad basically and that's where the tufton street type of people come in and they then lobby to create more of these things so it's a, a vicious cycle and it's deeply corrupt and the same thing happens with fossil fuel while with fossil fuel subsidies and profit taking and just if you just look at this so if you just take the figure of 83 billion on nuclear weapons and then you've got this figure of the company's getting 16 billion it's very hard to imagine what on earth are they doing with that money a lot of that money is leaking into the hands of massive profits because it's not as though the nuclear weapons have to be rebuilt every year so there's a lot of money just disappearing, as it were, and a lot of people are making an enormous money stream out of it. 
and there's a continuous supply of money to basically mislead us. So I'm afraid I see that as the underlying cause of the problem we're in. And then there's a few references there. Okay, that's the end of uh, my presentation. So I uh, hope that was useful. And obviously, I know we're going to have uh, discussions after this. So should I stop sharing my screen now? Uh, yes, please. Thanks very much. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning that um, really, if you've got any questions or comments, please add them to the chat or to the Q&A section, and then we'll we'll deal with them at the end when we've had both speakers, if that's all right. There are two two comments already, uh, or two uh, questions, so we'll, we'll come to those after Andy. So I'll introduce Andy now. Andy Sterling is a Professor of Science and Technology Policy at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex, where he co-directed the EPSRC STEP Centre for 16 years, working on issues of power, uncertainty and diversity in science and technology, especially around energy and biotech. He has served on a number of UK, EU and wider governmental advisory committees, including at present uh, as a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So another well-qualified and experienced speaker. So excellent. Thanks, Andy. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dave, and thanks for the invitation to you and colleagues, and uh, thanks to everyone for turning out on a Friday evening for this, and thanks to Phil for that really uh, rather chilling but very informative overview. I'm going to drill down on really on that last point that Phil made about the um, the scale of the what Phil called corruption, uh, covert channeling of resources that goes behind uh, this nuclear weapons infrastructure and how that affects climate change. And I'm going to drill down into one particular case of that, which has until recently not really been fully appreciated and is still very difficult to get discussion about, which is that the degree to which the UK governments of different complexions have been so favorable about nuclear power, civil nuclear power, is directly related to the commitment that Phil outlined to maintain nuclear weapons. And I'm going to break, make that case in two parts. I'll share my screen. First of all, because I think it's such a serious claim about climate action, about democracy, I'm going to substantiate it in some detail. I think the issues deserve that. So for people who may be, of course, this audience is probably being convened by CND, skeptical about nuclear weapons, to put it mildly, but there's plenty of people with that position who believe genuinely that nuclear power is kind of self-evidently attractive, not least for carbon uh, reduction to combat climate change. And that view is fostered by uh, a climate of the kind of thing Phil just showed in this country, uh, essentially propaganda that is seriously warping energy baits, slowing climate action and uh, having an adverse effect on British democracy more generally. So I want to spend the next uh, 20 minutes or a bit less now, having introduced it, on substantiating that. So first of all, let's take a look at why I am saying that nuclear power is not as is so often and so strongly claimed, a reasonable response, uh, a reasonable means to climate action. We hear all kinds of arguments made uh, for nuclear about cost, about uh, the climate uh, impact itself, about security, about baseload. And I just want to go through those in my first couple of slides, uh, just to make it really clear. I'm very happy to field questions at the end about this. Because the bottom line is, it's been clear to those who follow these issues closely for many years, it's now becoming irrefutable with changing trends, that nuclear power is far more costly than renewable energy. New forms are getting ever more costly. So just to look at a couple of numbers here, the 35 year contracts uh, secured for the Hinkley Point C power station, the only one that's currently under, under actual construction and, and, and currently more than a decade late, 
are 128 pounds per megawatt hour in current money. The contracts comparably to that being signed for offshore wind, despite all the a huge amount of press for the in, the recent increase because of the Ukraine effects of the Ukraine war on supply chains. But despite those increases, offshore wind contracts are currently at £40 a megawatt hour. There's a massive difference in the price of these two ostensibly zero carbon technologies. Of course, energy efficiency and demand management measures are even more cost effective and with a um, very large potential uh, than wind power. So against that background of what is already a quite remarkable difference in the costs of these technologies to address climate change, nuclear costs are growing rapidly. Renewable costs are falling fast. Here you see the Merchant Bank uh, Lazards are regarded as the sort of go to global source on these kinds of trends. They got a least cost of energy uh, uh, calculus and they this graph here, you don't need to see the detail to see that solar um, has been reducing absolutely extraordinarily over the past decade globally, 2009 to 2019. Uh, solar has gone down by 90% um, in costs. Wind costs are down 70%, but nuclear costs have risen by 26% worldwide. In the UK, actually, it's arguably higher than that. So the trends are also very unfavorable for um, nuclear power in comparison with renewable energy. Um, the next argument we get from the British government uh, and people uh, <clears throat> representing the nuclear industry are about baseload, that somehow, even though it's acknowledged to be more costly, we need nuclear power because what about when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? And to compensate for the fluctuating outputs. Well, it's been known in the industry for more than a decade that this is simply not true. Um, Steve Halliday, the then CEO of National Grid Company, said in 2015, that ideas of baseload are outdated, and yet they continue after more than a decade to be trotted out by government as a reason why they are so committed to such expensive nuclear power. Well, just a month ago, we saw from a source, the Royal Society, who have in the past been a major uh, protagonist of nuclear power, we saw this argument finally, I hope, nailed in the voice of <laughs> Uh, an authority who uh, might be taking some notice of. And the picture is a little bit complicated, but it's worth just thinking about it. On the vertical axis, you see the cost. That's a crucial uh, parameter here. The cost of a system for the UK, which is 100% carbon free. And the different curves show the nuclear contribution to that system. So the one on top is a 200 terawatt nuclear contribution, then the one below that in the middle is a 50 terawatt, so quite a lot smaller. And the one at the bottom is no nuclear power whatsoever on the British system. So that's 100% zero carbon, no nuclear. Under every scenario, what the Royal Society is saying here is that there is no scenario under which it costs less if you've got nuclear on the system. The idea of baseload is completely spurious. You can address the same functions as that by actually um, having uh, all kinds of storage, grid management technologies, which are also plummeting in price like the renewables are themselves. Now, that's the Royal Society, an independent voice. If we look at the British government's figures, we see that even they don't support this picture of uh, a commitment to nuclear power rather than renewable energy. There are the industry and energy ministry base, as was now Department of Energy, Security and Net Zero, um, these figures then are the, the government has not now for many years published officially in a white paper their estimates of the cost of nuclear compared to renewables because they are so embarrassing. But if you look at the grey literature that government uses in its modelling, you find that even they have to admit, even though they're very pessimistic about renewables, that the costs of renewables, including the costs of storage um, and interseasonal uh, management of uh, you know, fluctuating wind and, and sun 
even including those costs, they are significantly lower than nuclear power. So you don't have to go to independent voices like the Royal Society. Even the government itself is acknowledging that the costs of nuclear power are far higher, even including storage, than renewables. So what this means is that it is absolutely clear there is no room for argument in the UK, despite the fact that public debate seems not to be aware of this, that the more nuclear power you have on the British energy system, the less climate action is taking place, the slower it's taking place because the nuclear is so much slower to develop, and the more costly. You get much less carbon abatement for the pound. So what, why then do we see such a commitment in the UK to nuclear power? And here I'm going to just go through the evidence on the military side for why this is. Because in defence debates in the UK, parliamentary, uh, select committees, official documentation, documents by people involved in the military side, it's absolutely clear that they understand that without a civil nuclear power industry in the UK, it would not be possible to build nuclear propelled submarines. Because even though the costs of a nuclear submarine are extortionate in the way that uh, Phil referred to, that cost still does not include the cost of the infrastructure, the industrial base, the supply chain, the educational and research establishments, the specialist welding training, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that are necessary, ready to build the submarines and the submarine reactors. Those are all supported by a civil nuclear program funded by electricity revenues. So if the electricity revenues just went to renewables and didn't go to nuclear, we wouldn't have this dedicated nuclear infrastructure in the UK, and it would not be possible for companies like Babcock, Rolls-Royce, uh, uh, Cavendish, and other nuclear engineering companies who all build the submarines, they would not stay in business. In effect, electricity consumers are massively subsidizing the uh, nuclear weapon side, especially not so much the manufacture of the nuclear weapons themselves, but the manufacture of the platforms, these enormously expensive submarines that are themselves nuclear powered. Here we have BAE Systems, this quote at the top of my slide, um, in a report in 2007, nuclear submarines suffer criticism because their through life costs cannot be absorbed or masked by other programs, masked. That's BAE Systems being open about the aim of concealing the costs of nuclear submarines behind civilian nuclear electricity. Um, there is um, a lot of material being released by uh, Freedom of Information requests where government acknowledges exactly the same dynamic. It's absolutely clear. Rolls-Royce produced a dedicated report a few years ago entirely concerned with the aim of relieving the Ministry of Defence of the burden of developing and retaining skills and capabilities for the nuclear submarines. So they want to relieve the Ministry of Defence of that cost by offloading it onto the energy side so that consumers pay a higher price for nuclear electricity on the grounds that it's addressing climate change. But in fact, these higher costs are being funneled in ways Phil showed in his graphic into the nuclear uh, sector for building nuclear submarines. It's when we it's very difficult to get this into the press, but we have now uh, now got it into broadsheets quite a few times. It's never been refuted. It's sometimes been explicitly denied by government, even though on the defence side, the evidence is so clear. But on one occasion, uh, a few years ago, the permanent secretary, then permanent secretary of the Ministry of Defence, was asked a question based on evidence by Phil Johnston and I working on this analysis uh, for, for the Public Accounts Committee. And he was said, he was asked, um, so, so Stephen, is it the case, Stephen Lovegrove this is, is it the case that a large part of the reason why you signed these contracts for Think We Point C were in order to secure higher price electricity for from British consumers in order to fund the submarines? And he said this on the, on the parliamentary record that we are completing the build of nuclear submarines. There is very definitely an opportunity here for the nation to grasp in terms of nuclear skills. I do not think that's going to happen by accident. It's going to require concerted government action. That is the principal figure involved in this policy, admitting it to Parliament. And yet still, there's no press attention. And when one tries to get attention for this, it's extremely difficult to get it through the gatekeepers. Um, British ministers now and again, on, alongside 
denying this when it's put to them in the terms I'm putting it now. Other times they quietly say things like, I want to include the MOD more in everything we do. It's time that the artificial distinction between civil and military nuclear came to an end. And I will do my absolute best best to bring that about. This is the energy minister saying that back in 2018. The picture it's not just the UK here. The picture internationally supports the same general pattern. Uh, this is a complex chart. I hope uh, the slides are available so you can go through it at your leisure. Uh, it just compares the scale of the commitment of different countries around the world on the one hand, on the military side, and on the other, on the civil side to nuclear power. And there's a series of different distinctions um, made here. But the bottom line, since I don't have a lot of time, is this, that if you compare the intensity of commitment of nuclear power and the intensity of commitment to nuclear weapons, what you find is systematically that the leading global military powers are the most committed, without exception, to large scale new nuclear build. It is the nuclear weapons countries that are keen on building nuclear power when the worldwide picture is as grim as I showed at the beginning of my talk. There is no global or regional military power that does not hold an active history of very strong pressures for civil nuclear power. So there's an almost perfect correlation there. And no country either with or planning nuclear weapons or submarines is currently pursuing a nuclear moratorium or a phase out on the civilian side. So they know all these countries with submarines and weapons know that if they were to get rid of their nuclear power industries, they would be left finding it very difficult to fund, even though they're spending so much on the books on these nuclear weapons infrastructures, they would have to spend even more um, because the subsidy from the electricity consumers would be removed. Uh, in the USA, um, in the same way that Phil documented, they tend to be more open about these issues. It's actually become, actually since we first started publishing this in the international academic literature, then it started to be the case that elite policy bodies in the USA and other countries started to acknowledge this. The Innovation Reform Project, the Atlantic Council, former Secretaries of State for Energy have all uh, acknowledged explicitly that it is the case that nuclear power has to be maintained in the UK, in the USA on the civilian side in order to fund what they call the nuclear navy. Uh, a leaked US government mem memorandum in 2018 talked about our national security relies on a robust civilian nuclear power industry because that's the way you keep the nuclear weapons industry in business. The Atlantic Council, a, a think tank very close to the Pentagon and, uh, and Congress, uh, put a figure in the US on the overall annual value of this subsidy from the security side, from the civilian side to the security side at $26 billion per year. And in France, the situation is very similar. There's less data. But back in 2020, following a series of scandals, actually, on this same issue, uh, again, after it first appeared in the academic literature, finally, in 2020, President Macron said to oppose civilian nuclear and military nuclear in terms of production and research does not make sense for a country like ours. Without civilian nuclear, no military nuclear. Without military nuclear, no civilian nuclear. That's the president of France. So the bottom line then is very clear. It is that there is in the UK as well elsewhere a massive hidden subsidy from electricity consumers to the military nuclear industry. Um, the truth is that the costs of the UK nuclear submarine capabilities are insupportable without civil nuclear infrastructures. It's very difficult to put a figure on this. I could say more about detailed interactions with the uh, Public Accounts Committee and the National Audit Office if people are interested in it, but that's the bottom line. The strong UK government support for civil nuclear power at least partly reflects military interests. I'm not saying here that it's a, a, some sort of conspiracy because many people genuinely are misled by the official figures that misrepresent the actual cost of nuclear power and the actual reasons for the UK's commitment to it. A similar picture is visible worldwide. It's officially acknowledged elsewhere, but not in the UK, even though in the UK, you might think there's more pressure because both France and USA have a bigger civilian nuclear industry um, than the UK does. So the pressures in the UK are correspondingly more intense to funnel this money from the one side to the other. 
But what's remarkable is in the UK, the energy policy documents and debate more generally, other than a few commentators like ourselves pointing it out repeatedly, leave these pressures completely hidden. It's completely concealed in the UK. What's happening now, though, is that the accelerating competitiveness of renewable energy is progressively making this impossible to conceal. So as time goes on, uh, we're going to see this become more, uh, I think, grudgingly acknowledged. What's going on then is that military interests are driving the argument that we need nuclear power, not climate change interests. This is being done outside defence budgets because it's being paid for by consumers or by risk bearing by the uh, by the Treasury. It's off the public books because this doesn't appear in the defence budget or any public budget. And it's out of public scrutiny because it's not being admitted. It's even being denied on the energy side. Um, and the, the scale of this subsidy, if you simply take this, the, the proportion of uh, nuclear in the mix that's envisaged, then it's of the order of £10 billion a year, which is very significant in relation to defence budgets generally. But these figures obviously need to be worked through properly. The problem is they're not getting the scrutiny they deserve. Maybe most serious, and this is where I end my talk, is that the evidence that we, uh, Phil Johnston and I, and associated colleagues have come up with on this has actually been very clearly aired now, despite the difficulties in getting it through. I can talk more about those difficulties. The Guardian, the Independent, the BBC, the Telegraph, Forbes magazine, select committees, uh, parliamentary committees of other kinds uh, have, have looked at this. It's never been refuted. It's sometimes just been denied in one-liners, but never with substantiation. Um, but it's simply after you get a particular newspaper article come in, and then you get no more discussion, despite the magnitude of what is at stake here. It's really quite remarkable. So in the end, alongside the fact that these commitments to nuclear power in the UK are making climate action smaller, they're slowing it down, and they're making it far more expensive than it needs to be. In the end, I would say that the most serious implications of this link between nuclear weapons and climate action is actually for the health of democracy, because they're simply not discussed, and the means by which that's actually maintained are extremely worrying. So uh, yeah, I hope that was uh, clear and helpful to this discussion. Sorry, I'll unmute myself. Thanks very much, Andy. That's brilliant. That's a heck of a lot of information, I think, from both speakers. So j just to say that this is being recorded, and so we will put a recording of this on uh, certainly on the C Yorkshire CND website. So if you want to go there, www.yorkshirecnd.org.uk, um, and it may be also posted elsewhere, but we don't know about that just yet. Just yet. <clears throat> so um, please put your comments and questions when you have them in the chat, and we'll go through. There's a couple there, I think, already. Um, there was a question by, from uh, Andy Lohman, Andrew Lohman, presumably, I think he's talking about the, the yield on nuclear weapons, Phil, during your talk. Presu presumably on the lowest yield setting, the damage is less. Uh, I don't know if that would be cost effective to yeah. set the yield low. Can you comment on that? I honestly can't see what the point would be, um, really. Um, it, if it's the deterrent, which they won't talk about the specifics, but it's always been to destroy Moscow and a range of other Russian cities, you're not going to do that with small nuclear weapons. If, on the other hand, um, you want to attack military capabilities, it doesn't make much sense to have small nuclear weapons. The only excuse you might have would be, ah, yes, we're going to use Trident as some kind of small nuclear strike. But that's incredibly risky because when the Trident missile is on its way, you see a missile. You don't know what warhead's in it you'd have to assume it's a major attack. So it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, there's no, 
it would be very dangerous militarily because it would utterly confuse the situation in the same way that the Americans are planning when they've got nuclear weapons in the air, in the sea and on land already, they're now thinking of bringing in a surface launched nuclear warhead on a cruise missile. Well, that because of the threats from China, but that's, that's really, really dangerous because if you were in a conflict, which would be bad enough, and then somebody fires a missile at a ship. A cruise missile is a slow-moving autonomous plane, basically. So if some of those were nuclear-tipped, you'd have to think, ah, we're being attacked with a nuclear weapon. So it escalates things already. It's, it's very, very dangerous. Just imagine in the Ukraine... Russian situation if people thought one of those um, air defence systems was firing a nuclear weapon. Just imagine if they thought that, how dangerous that would be. But they know they're not nuclear tips. But if you if there were nuclear weapons around which could be fired and mistaken for those things, you're, that's what causes horrible, horrible escalations and is very destabilising. Um, so it's a no from me. doesn't make any sense. And having spoken to various military people in the past, I think they'd think it was a very bad idea as well. I think it's a way of trying to sell the nuclear weapon to... It's another way of misleading the public, I would suggest. Thanks a lot, Phil. Um, I think this is one for you, uh, Andy, <clears throat> uh, from Dear Linda. Is then the case that to avoid funding the nuclear weapons subsidy, the more solar PV we install in our homes and businesses with battery storage, so we become as far as possible as self-sufficient, would be denying that funding? Uh, it's a great uh, thought. I totally support it. But uh, sadly, it would not affect the scam, if you, if you forgive the shorthand, that I've described. Because what's happening here is that if we installed it ourselves, we're, we're installing distributed generation, which is then sold to the grid. What I'm talking about is the government mandating contracts for centralized production of renewable energy on the one hand, but also nuclear power and setting those contracts at level. So they're looking to have 30% of UK electricity by uh, 2040 or so um, produced from new generation nuclear power together with the Sizewell C. Um, and Hingley Point C power stations if those are finished. That that would be contracted centrally and electricity consumers for the electricity that they buy uh, from the grid would be paying for that anyway. So those of us who um, at the margins install solar solar power, when on those occasions when we're buying it, we'd still be we'd still be contributing to the subsidy and the prices would be set nationally to achieve that. So if the whole country were to do that, then you start destabilizing that kind of thing. But sadly, we're a long way from the whole country doing that. And though at the margins, I'm afraid it, it doesn't actually change. It's very worthwhile doing, though. Uh, it helps to stimulate the industry, so I support it. But uh, it wouldn't change this. This is centrally organized by government. If I could throw a point, I mean, I've got solar panels and I've got battery storage. And at the moment, I tend to... Um, use electricity in the middle of the night when it's very cheap so um, anybody doing that is actually um, bucking the system to a large extent because i pay about half the price i, I see what you're saying andy yeah. though that unless every if everybody was doing it I, they'd have a big problem wouldn't they they would but the thing is it you know domestic use is only part of the uh electric right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but but also the, po the point here, the reason I put it in the way I did, Phil, is I don't want to make people think that simply by, I mean, absolutely, we've done it too. You should, we've brought community into community renewables. One should do that, support renewables every way you can. But don't by doing that, thinking somehow you're stopping this scam because exact what's happening is prices just go up for the rest of the people. Yeah. And, well, and also, blamed on, they're yeah. blamed, that's then blamed on renewables. So you have the mainstream newspapers, rather than covering this issue, they in completely spuriously, uh, give coverage, including papers like The Guardian very often, to claims made 
that the high electricity prices are to do with renewable energy. Mm. So they blame it on renewable energy. People, So then people's propensity to actually believe in the worthwhileness of doing what you say is affected as well, because they think it's much more expensive than it is. This isn't the case in a country like Germany. It is in the UK because we have a massive amount of propaganda uh, being funded uh, in a way you showed in your final slide to make people think that way. So it's we ha the only way here is to to actually have political change in the way the electricity system is run rather than just at the margin. Yeah. And also, as you point out, most of the, the key, <clears throat> the huge consumption is actually industrial use, isn't it? Industrial and commercial. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. There's a, another one, I think, mainly for you, Andy, at the moment. Uh, it would be good to hear some more about your battles to get hold of this information. And have you tried uh, talking to people in the media to get their take on why the issues aren't ever followed up? Yes. Yes. Uh, so over the course of the few years that Phil Johnson and I have been working on this, we have approached 20, the 20 leading energy journalists in the country on these issues. Uh, with exception of two, all of them were enthusiastic to take up the story in the beginning. And without exception, all those 18 were then dropped the story because their editors had said they should. Um, the reasons given were it's a conspiracy theory or it's so obvious, don't we all know that it's not new and varying in between. The only people, so I mentioned we've had really quite a lot of coverage now over the years from The Guardian, Independent, BBC, um, it's come from non-energy journalists, investigative journalists and other journalists. Ambrose Evans Pritchard, columnist in The Telegraph, did a very big piece on it. So you've had really quite graphic pieces in broadsheet papers. BBC, Roger Harabin for the Today programme, when he first tried it, uh, it got blocked on the morning I was supposed to be going up there for the Today programme, uh, cancelled. But that happens, you know, that can happen anyway. But uh, when he later covered it, just before he retired, he put it straight onto the BBC website and told me that was to avoid the gatekeepers. So what you've got here is a sense, I don't know what it's founded on, that if this story is covered, especially by people who depend on official sources in the energy sector, they won't cover it because they're, they're just concerned that it will affect, uh, I think, their, their sources. So that's why I make the remarks I do about the implications of British democracy, because there's absolutely no doubt, because the story hasn't been refuted, it's not that we're wrong, it's just that it's very difficult to get in the press. You only get it in there when somebody's guard is dropped and you don't get it in through the coverage of the energy sector itself. And that really is a very bad situation. It's, it's, and, and the experiences, I won't go into them, I'll stop here, but the experiences Phil and I have had trying to pursue this story, I, I, I thought I was quite a hard-nosed uh, critical uh, researcher, but the things that happen when you work on this story uh, are remarkable. It, it is a different country than I thought a few years ago I lived in. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and this probably applies to both of you, really, uh, from Martin Tiller. <clears throat> this has been fascinating, but from a practical campaigning point of view, how can we work better with organisations whose principal concern is the climate crisis? Are we getting anywhere with that? Who wants to go first? I've spoken a lot recently, Phil. Do you want to go first? Oh, right. Well, we are starting to have joint meetings. For example, um, there was a festival for survival, a uh, big conference held in Glasgow last weekend. I spoke at it remotely, but various people went. And there was an international attendance, and people were very much talking about nuclear power, nuclear weapons and the climate crisis and making the connections. And I was presenting similar information, making that connection. And other people were very aware of these connections. So I think the two movements are realising they can support each other. So we just need to, we need to build on that. I mean, this the promotion for this is very much along those lines as as well um i think we've got to get together with climate campaigners and realize we have common interests because we're we're both facing existential threats it's as simple as that 
and I would add to that actually that it again following from what we both said this huge amount of resource and attention going into conditioning public opinion is really significant here so Phil and I have documented in social media uh, alongside the, 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 the conventional media picture I just talked about the extraordinary activity going on on social media Twitter as was uh, blogging organizations set up like greens for nuclear mothers for nuclear um, a whole series we've counted more than 20 of them set up in the last few years just the last few years ostensibly motivated by climate you have characters like Mike Lyoness you have the remarkable about face by George Monbiot only three days after the Fukushima accident where strangely George Monbiot decided then three days after Fukushima that now was the time to back nuclear just when the government was explicit about its desire to shift public opinion in the aftermath of Fukushima. I don't know what the dynamic was there, but it's a, whether it's contrarianism or something else, it's remarkable that they'll keep whatever position one takes. And if there's plenty of people who are genuinely motivated and are not impugning who support nuclear for climate reasons. They're just not properly informed. So they're doing so with integrity. So I'm not impugning that. But the pattern, if you look at it, just why should it be, for instance, Greens for Nuclear, why should it be that the Green Party for its entire history, for half a century, has been critical of nuclear power. So you've all seen a foundational commitment of the Green Party. The, whatever position side one is on, pro or anti-nuclear, it's not deniable that it's in the last five years that the case for nuclear has just gone through the floor because the costs have gone up compared to renewables, which have completely outcompeted nuclear. So in the last five years, it's been easier than it's ever been to make the case for why nuclear power is what the Green Party has always said. And yet it is in those last few years that Greens for Nuclear starts up. So like with all these other organizations. So one has to ask about the pattern without impugning individuals that we see here the imprint of an awful lot of money being spent on propaganda. And as a result of that, people who, you know, it's quite understandable, they want a life, they want to pay attention to all the issues I've been putting in my slides. Uh, they just think that, well, nuclear is helping us from climate change. We've got to do everything without thinking that you don't do everything. You do what's effective. If you do everything, you waste money and do less. So um, we're, we're really captured to an extraordinary extent by propaganda. And a lot of people are being misled by this on the climate action side. And, and so it, it's not just a question of collaborating. We have to point this out. This is why I'm, I try to work. You know, it sounds a bit harsh sometimes, some of the things I say, but I think we really need to have an open democratic discussion about the degree to which our debates are being seriously warped by this nuclear military industrial complex that we're living in. I think that's a very good point. I think I you I can't help noticing all these people. I'm not even sure they are real people who pop up on social media suddenly making the case and arguing craziness about climate, saying there isn't really a climate problem, and things like this. They've all popped up out, out of the woodwork, and there was the huge attack on um, uh, University of East Anglia, wasn't there? A while back, and I think we need to highlight this more. There's there's a whole bevy of organisations based out of Tufton Street, for example, and there's loads of other ones. And we've got to keep pointing this out because without reasonably accurate information, you haven't got any semblance of democracy. It's under enough threat as it is for various reasons. So I think that's a, a key point that we all, I mean, I think there's something we've made the point. It's something that the international campaign against nuclear weapons is making the point. Um, there appears to be so much corruption going on in government in the UK, and I suspect elsewhere, with contracts for mates, privatisation of public services. We've got very, very big, very, very big problems, um, essentially. So I think we've got to highlight that. Um, I saw something on the chat saying, my ecotricity electricity is not cheaper. Dale Vint said the price is fixed by oil and gas. Well, the answer is change your energy supply. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Octopus Agile gives a half hourly price. So you can I mean, choose your, your, you know, 
the prices as paid by consumers are a function of so many factors. Yeah. Uh, that the prices that you pay as a consumer. That's why, again, I emphasize the need for attention at the central governance level here, because they're 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 so affected by you know perfectly legitimately. It's not a by all kinds of factors. What the figures I gave in my talk were from two types of ways of calculating costs: least cost of energy, which is what Lazard, Bloom, um, Bloomberg, and others use. Government, British government uses it, which is just an engineering cost, or the contract costs, the wholesale contract costs. So those are the two figures on my slides where I made the case for nuclear being um, much as a third, or, uh, three times more expensive, a third as cost effective as offshore wind. So that's where you see the rubber hit the road. Uh, when you when you look at the prices you pay as a consumer to different com companies, you're dealing with all kinds of other factors. You can't really separate it out. The marginal, where does the margin, I mean, with electricity, where we basically play the marginal cost price of gas, don't we, as my understanding. It, so, it is set, I mean, it's still set, gas, gas is, we, we're like the cartoon character gone off the edge of the cliff, their feet are still uh, rotating, uh, so we haven't yeah. yet adjusted to the fact that the electricity mix now is very different than it's been in the past. That's happening. But the, the reliable thing to see where the future goes is what are these contracts being signed yeah. for 30 yeah. years for wind and for 35 years for nuclear what are the contracts you that's where you start seeing real and benefit. i believe that the term for those is contracts for difference is that the correct sort yes. of term yes. for them yeah and in your if you were to put in the marginal prices you that you'd suddenly see all the prices merging together to some extent wouldn't you yeah it, it's there's so many factors in it, it, it it's, yeah it, with prices cost is is really and and contract contracts you know other 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 more robust way of talking about it i think i think there's actually quite a strong campaigning issue here which we could on the nuclear side and the um environmental side highlight the fact we're paying far too much for electricity there's lots of reasons for that the marginal cost price is something which people know about and what you've highlighted oh by the way there's a big subsidy for Hinkley and the and size will be and all the rest of it. Yeah. And um, I think that's I think that's a real chink in the armour. I think we could jointly campaign on that quite yeah. strongly because people are being ripped off, aren't they? Yeah, I, I think. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm this is an interesting. I, I've got a thought on that. But Dave, did you want to go to anyone else before I because there's a thought on what we, we've got a couple more. Kind okay. of points here. That's, um, good. That's more important. Yeah, let, let's do those, and then yeah. you can kind of have a summing yeah. up thing where you can yeah. bring in anything you like, really. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's just uh, I don't know whether you can do this, but somebody is asking, dear Linda, I think, please could you supply a, a list of all the organisations promoting nuclear power? I, I, is that a possibility? Well, uh, I'm actually a bit of a. Uh, I've got a personality defect. I do make lists. Uh, anyone emailing me, I could send that. But um. But I think what, maybe what the question is about is what I referred to about these organizations popping up on social media recently. Yeah. I think the best place to go for that, Phil, again, my colleague, Phil Johnson, who's accompanied me in all this work that I've been talking about, and I did a piece for um, Open Democracy, a blog, uh, just two years ago, um, where we not only talk about that, we, we document that whole argument I made, uh, and then lots and lots of links to these organizations. Uh, so that whole argument, uh, so if you look for my name, Andy Sterling and Open Democracy, I think I've done two uh, pieces for them. So it's a more recent one. Uh, you'll see it there. If you have trouble finding it that way, then please let me know. But that's, I think, going to be spot on what you're you're after, I think. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, finally, one from the end of all the saying that a lot of the people who pop up, they aren't suspect, they're not pretending to be organizations they just pop up as individuals if it's on twitter if you look at their background you suddenly find they've just popped up out of nowhere they've got no credible background or they've got some ridiculous background like they just like pies and playing football or something like that and then surprisingly enough they're having a go at this oh this climate change the sun's getting hotter or something like this also sometimes the the organisations are individual people, or um, even the same people doing under the different different guises. Well, it's trolling, basically. Yeah, right. So uh, finally, uh, do you think George Monbiot would debate with either of you? <laughs> um, he's a bit so vitriolic about anti-nuclear campaigners. 
Yeah. And he does not have the excuse. He doesn't understand the issues. Yeah. Well, George Monbiot, you know, on base of his work over his career, I, I have had and still have for a large part of it, a huge amount of respect. Um, I, as for debating, when he went, the reason I said what I did about his vault fast three days after the Fukushima accident is I was so shocked, not by him changing his view. Everyone's got the right to change their view. But by the utterly spurious evidence he was citing on the grounds of being scientific evidence for why he was shifting his view towards nuclear power and i, I knew that because how I, how it's the area i specialize in as an academic um served on advisory committees on those issues and he was just completely wrong so i engaged in an exchange with him so i did debate with him privately uh, it went through about three iterations and then when it was exhausted in the sense that he wasn't able to substantiate what he'd said and said with great intensity as well, uh, he then just dropped the conversation. So I would be enormously happy to debate with him. Um, I, I just think without, you know, it, it is legitimate for people to be favorable to nuclear power. I'm not ruling that out. There's lots of uncertainties and it's politics and politics is legitimate. If you put a high value, if you love nuclear power stations aesthetically, you love the kind of society they need, it's, it, it, they lead to, it's legitimate. I don't, I wouldn't try and invoke some sort of authority and say you're just damn right wrong it's not tenable but if you what i do object to is people putting spurious arguments conjuring things up and then becoming ever more animated as their argument gets thinner which is what i think characters like sadly on this issue and on also gm issues actually george monbiot has done and mark linus a similar character there's a very potent pr trope i'm not saying either of those individuals are motivated by this but the pr industry knows and it's well documented there is no more effective salesperson than somebody who says, I used to be, but now I'm not. That just is a sort of mind bomb, as they say, a depth charge goes into people's minds. PR industry knows that. They've used it for years in marketing. Um, and I have lost count of the number of people on the nuclear side who use that trope. And I've more than a dozen of them uh, going way back. I've had the chance to discuss and say, but you said you were once critic of nuclear and now you're not but i don't think you ever were were you and they admit they weren't this is coaching uh people um as uh, david king the chief science advisor said it kirsty gogan uh who was a leading uh, uh, uh nuclear proponent uh and gone to the states i think now but they've all admitted to me individually yes you're right but you guys do that as well was what kirsty said to me so these are so and and this is exactly what mark linus and George Monbiot are trading on as well. So whether it's in, inadvertent, whether it's manipulation, or whether they know exactly what they're doing, I don't know. But it's it's we are on the receiving end of some very strategic communication. Thank you. I think that's probably we've been going for a little while now, and I want well, to thank you very much for. Well, there's a question about size. Well, wasn't there? Whether we think it'll ever be built? Oh yeah, sorry. One's just come up. I, I, I have to say I've no idea, but I hope not. <laughs> but I don't know what Andy's got to say about it. Yeah, well, you know, uh, it, it, if you look at the economics uh, and the performance, it would not be. But the problem is, I, the reason I'm drawing, you know, I think drawing attention to this military dynamic is so strong. If Britain relinquishes its collective, you know, especially the elite in the UK, uh, this need, post-colonial need, to be on the Security Council of the UN, which isn't formally dependent on nuclear weapons possession, but de facto, that's who the five permanent members are. They are the five uh, official nuclear weapon states. If Britain continues with this mentality, then I think it will, as a, one, as a Labour minister responsible for acquiring nuclear weapons in the first place said, we want this stuff and we want a, a British flag on it, whatever the cost. So whatever, if it's a military thing and it's tied to British identity for a large part of our uh, fellow citizens, then that's what will happen. And so the, the, the arrangements they've made both on the consumer side for paying higher contracts uh, that I've talked about, also this thing called RAB, regulated asset base, where the treasury picks up the risk if it goes over the cost, then the treasury, which means, of course, taxpayers cover it. We've got consumers subsidizing, taxpayers subsidizing uh, in ways that are not really very visible. And unless the tension gets to it in the press, then Sizewell C will be built, uh, even though it's an utter crock. And it will be built for the reasons I've said, to keep in business Babcock, Cavendish, Rolls-Royce, and these other companies under the, under the, in the supply chain, who then are, are available to build the submarines. 
Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks. You, thank you very much again, both of you. For uh, I don't know if you have any final words you want to say before we we finish. Uh, I think you've said quite a few things. <laughs> it's quite a lot. Digesting for all the information you've given. In fact, go on. Thank Andy, you. you no thanks for the invitation. No thanks to everyone for for the attention and the, and the great uh, comments and questions. And thanks to you guys for. The, the, the chat. I, I would say the same, and I think um, Andy's information is is very important. And the more we get that out there, the better. Um, and I think this whole issue of the corruption cycle, as I've called it, the military industrial, it's the lobbying propaganda cycle is very important as well. Because I think that enables you to understand what on earth is going on and you realize this problem is rather more ingrained it also challenges your view on what you thought you were living in this supposed um, democracy that you thought you were living in i'm afraid and i mean some people have suggested that the uk is one of the most corrupt countries around with offshore deals and all the rest of it um, but we have this post-colonial view of ourselves, which is entirely misleading. But somehow we've got to find ways of putting arguments together, which um, appeal to the non-converted. Let's put it that way. That's our key task, rather than going guns blazing. But I think I think the corruption issue is is a big one. Um, you've only got to look at some of this money and you think what on earth is it being spent on because it's very hard when i looked at the nuclear spending and when you look at the fossil you think what on earth are they actually well it's easier with with the fossil fuel people you think well yeah they are i suppose they are drilling holes and they're digging stuff out but with the military when they're not actually fighting a war but they're taking all this money what on earth are they doing with it you know if you try to go through if you try to follow all the pounds or the dollars i think you'd find yourself in some pretty murky places actually that's what i th i think is the old watergate thing follow the money yeah always a good always good advice yeah well, thank, thanks a lot again i think thanks uh, for the invitation we haven't gone into why the uk should want nuclear weapons i guess it's partly to keep this idea of being on the top table as they say uh, yeah. so it seems a huge amount of money a huge amount of waste of human resources just to keep on the top table that really you shouldn't want to be on anyway um but thanks again thanks a lot let's hope the debate the discussion continues until we get some sense Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for attending, too. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.